Everyone, please welcome Dr. CTO Justin Cormack. Hello. Welcome to day two of DockerCon. Are we having fun? Are we learning new things? Yay. We had a great day yesterday. We talked a lot about the growth in our community, the new things that are coming, better performance, faster builds, Docker Scout, Docker Debug, Open PubKey, all sorts of new exciting things. Um, it was really great fun. We had a great day together learning. It was great to meet you all. Um, really exciting. Uh, really looking forward to day two. Today, we're going to talk about the future of application development. A decade ago, when Docker started, we came into the world, we burst onto the scene, and we changed the world of application development forever. And it was a pretty exciting time. We're all in this industry because we love the constant rate of change, the constant excitement, the constant new things. Last year, large language models brought AI to everyone's attention. There was a huge change. Like AI and ML have been around for a long time, but it was a, it was a step change, a sudden excitement, explosion of creativity, explosion of new ideas and exploration, and everyone wanted to get involved. And there were two things we learned at Docker about that. One is that the whole build chair run model and the whole Docker tooling was really, really, really important in this new AI ML world. People you know, wanted to still be able to ship reliably to production. The development experience was really important. All that was really, you know, there was a lot of continuity with the decade of change. The second thing you told us was that you really wanted to get started and learn this new stuff because it's a whole new tech stack, a whole new set of things, and lots of so many people were excited and wanted to explore and learn because this was just really, really exciting. So we got together with a bunch of our uh, community and um, the people we love to work with to bring you a great get started experience. Now, you don't want me talking. You want demos, don't you? So let's, <laughs> let's build with Docker. Let's um, welcome Harrison from Langchain, Michael from Neo4j, and Jeffrey from uh, Alama, um, and let's Ha have a demo. Hello, DockerCon. I am Hi. so excited this morning to build a new generative AI application. And the so, easiest way to get up and running with this is the Docker Gen AI stack. Excellent. So. These are, the, these are the partners we've brought together. And you've got to imagine that this is the development team at a company called Recursive Inc. Um, they build next-gen software. They're a pretty rock star dev team. I'm pretty, uh, pretty excited to have them on board at, the, uh, at Recursive. Now, Recursive does next-gen software, so they have a lot of customer support questions. They have a big customer support portal because people have a lot of questions about next-gen software. Building a, building a customer support application for Recursive is what this team has decided to do. They've decided to use LLMs to build a new um, stack to help people answer these support questions. Recursive has a great big um, database of internal questions from many years about um, next-gen software and things. If you look closely at these questions, you might recognize them from Stack Overflow. But hey, we all copy things off Stack Overflow sometimes, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> so um, the team are going to get started. They're going to use Docker Compose because that's a great way to get started. Um, and we've got a stack which has a um, an Alama model. That's a, the language model from Alama. We have um, Langchain um, to hold it all together and build the application and provide observability. And then we have Neo4j providing the database for the um, the, the extra data we're going to bring in. So let's go. It all starts with a familiar command you know and love, docker compose up. I'll go ahead and run that, and you can see the different components of the Gen AI stack being brought up. The first component is the AI model. And for this, we're using a new tool named Llama to download and run the popular Llama 2 model by Meta. The second component is the vector and graph database named Neo4j. 
And lastly, we have a Python application powered by Langchain, the orchestration layer for Gen AI applications. Looks like these different components are now up and running. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up in my browser. I'm greeted with the screen where I can uh, prompt and ask questions and chat with this model. So I'll go ahead and ask it a question. How do I summarize PDFs using Langchain? It's a bit of a trick question. It seems like the model's giving me an answer, and it's all running locally here on my Mac. Unfortunately, though, the model doesn't really seem to know what Langchain is or how to use it. So how are we going to solve this problem? For that, I'm in luck because my teammate Michael here can show us how we can augment this model with the knowledge it needs to answer the question correctly. Thank you, Jeff. So uh, as, <clears throat> as Justin already said, we have this large knowledge base of existing customer question and answers uh, that we want to integrate into our application. So our, our second app that we are running here is uh, the importer app, uh, this one, uh, that basically allows you to uh, pick any tag that you're interested in from the knowledge base that we're using, this kind of public knowledge base for the demo. And it will import the, this data into, a, into the knowledge graph, into the graph database, vectorize it for, for the vector search, and then it's ready to be used by the Gen AI application. So if you import this data into, into the knowledge base, it basically looks like this. Uh, so you see uh, the um, purple ones are questions, uh, the orange ones are tags uh, that we imported here, and these are all the length chain questions uh, from, from Stack Overflow. Right? So we should be now able to basically switch the mode of this model um, to include this information from the database send it together with the user question to the LLM, and have the LLM generate a useful answer for us. So let's see how well this works. So I'll use the same question uh, that Jeff just used. I just copy and paste it so I don't have to type things. And uh, put this in here. And switch to RAG enabled. So RAG stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation. It means whatever I do with the LLM, it's not based on the data that the LLM was trained on, but it's only using the language skills of the LLM. Completely ignores the training data and gives you it basically all the context information to generate the answer as part of the prompt. Right? So and that's what we do here. We take the question from the user, turn it into vector, query the database, then from the knowledge graph, pull all the relevant context from this information and send all this text information to, uh, to the LLM, which then uses that to answer this question as such. And as you can see, now it suddenly knows about Langchain. It knows about uh, the pipe PDF loader and um, embeddings and, and vector databases. And what's especially cool is you've all seen uh, ChatGPT make stuff up, and then it never was able to produce sources for the things that it, uh, that it made up. But here, because our information comes from a database, we pass along with the information also the source links. So uh, I can basically now just open one of these source links, and you see that it goes back to the, to the source of the question. So that becomes much more trustworthy and reproducible and verifiable in terms of answers. Right? But what's happening behind the scenes, what's happening uh, under the hood, uh, Harrison will show us how we can actually peek behind the corners and also look at the code to see how we uh, operate behind the scenes. So as Michael mentioned, this is using a technique known as RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation, where it pulls in extra data. Um, and so, so this is an example of a chain that Langchain helps orchestrate, which is basically a template to create an application in a few lines of code. And so to show exactly what's going on, I'm going to use LangSmith, which is our observability and tracing platform, to show the difference between the first chain, which didn't have RAG enabled, and the second one, which does. So if we click into this, this is the first chain that Jeff ran. And so we can see that there's two components to this chain. There's a prompt template, and then there's a call to an LLM. And so let's make this a little bit bigger so we can see exactly what's going on. If we click into the prompt, um, we can see that we have our inputs here. So this is the question that was asked. How do I summarize PDFs using LangChain? And there's, there's no chat history, but this is also a conversational bot. So it enables this, this back and forth iteration if, if we want to do that. 
We can also see a bunch of metadata about the run. So we can see the, the serialized version of the chat prompt template here. Um, and, and, and then we can also see the final thing that the chat template produces, which is these two messages, a system message and a human message. These are ways to pass inputs into the language model. And we do that ex exactly in the next step, where we interact with Chat Llama, which is the Llama model. We can click on the metadata field, um, and we can see a lot of information about the Llama model here. So we can see the name of the model that we're using and all the parameters that are going into it, and where it's being hosted, which is locally. If we go back to the run, we can see the exact input to the model here, system and human, and then we can see the output. And this is the same thing that was generated in the UI. Let's now look to see how that compares with this other chain, the retrieval QA with sources chain. If we expand the full trace, we can see that there's more steps. There's first a retrieval step. So let's click into this. We can see that we have an input query, how do I summarize PDFs using LangChain? And then the output is now a list of documents. And so this is using Neo4j to look up the list of documents behind the scenes. If we look at the metadata, if we look at the little side panel here, we can see that this retriever is tagged with Hugging Face Embeddings, which are open source embeddings, as well as the Neo4j vector store. So we can see exactly where this retrieved data is coming from. Now if we click into the chain, we can expand it to see exactly what's going into the language model. And so we can see here that we now have this system message that instructs the language model to use the following pieces of context to answer the question at the end. And then we have the documents from Stack Overflow, or not Stack Overflow, um, which we're using to ground the language model in our response. And here we get back the, the AI-assisted answer. So this is hopefully a good sneak peek as to what exactly is going on behind the scenes. We'll be doing a much deeper dive on this at 11.45 right here in this room. So I'd encourage you guys to come here and check that out if that's interesting. Um, and, and with that, I'd like to thank uh, Docker for having us and, and, and yeah, encourage everyone to explore Gen AI on Docker. Thank you. Thanks, that was so cool. And it was exciting just to be able to learn and do, do things like that. You can try this out yourself. Click on the link in the learning center of the latest Docker desktop, or go straight to the GitHub repo. And you can put your own data in. You can change the models. You can play around with it. You can rebuild it. You can rewrite it. You can do anything you like with it. So really, really cool. Um, and as a deep dive talk, 1145, if you want to learn more, and all of the team are at their booths and can help you as well. If that inspired you to build with AI and ML, join our hackathon. We've, we're running the hackathon for the next month. Um, there's a hack space down here. There's online support. So there's people ready to help you with all your problems. Um, it's going to be really exciting. Let's build some cool things. This, if this has inspired you, you can build something like this. Or you, there's many, many other things you can build or, uh, with, with Docker, AI, ML, and, and um, it, it, this exciting world of Gen AI. Now, we love to work with our customers and understand how Docker is helping them build things more effectively, faster, and in, build amazing stuff. It's always so cool spending time with them. Um, we, we, um, we, we spend a lot of time talking to customers, working with them. Um, I'm sure you've heard of this customer. I'm sure you've assembled their products. Let's learn about how they assemble their own applications with Docker and AI. So um, welcome, Karen. Um, <laughs> great to see you. Great to see you. Hello, everybody. How are we doing today at DockerCon? Woo! Woo! Slightly more people than yesterday, maybe. All right. Uh, Glad to be here, see you in person, and, and speak about our ML platform. But before we do that, uh, who are we? Uh, we are Inca Group. We are the retail arm of IKEA, which means we are the ones that are managing, running the different stores and, and pickup points that you've been to our planning studios. And we are essentially a 42 billion revenue company uh, and headquartered in Netherlands. We are over 177,000 co-workers across these different stores and different formats that we have. And we get about 3.8 billion uh, in terms of hits to IKEA.com. And 
we operate in about 31 different countries. Apart from that, uh, physically, we are in about 482 locations, uh, both as large format stores, small format stores, planning studios, pickup points, and so on. Apart from that, we also have a shopping center business across 14 countries where we manage shopping malls, uh, which have IKEA stores in them. We also believe in creating better homes and our products and our range reflects that and, and you will see, for example, a product like a backgun which reduces 95% of tap water usage when it's used as a nozzle. We're also a value-driven company and over 80% of our coworkers believe in our values, live our values. We also have uh, sustainability and circularity at our core and the last years we've refurbished and sold about 32 million products, uh, giving them a second lease of life. And apart from that, we're also quite diversity focused. Uh, at our leadership levels, we have a 50-50 gender balance between male and female. Apart from that, uh, we're also big on corporate social responsibility. We always try to help the refugees by making them employable, as well as react to situations like, for example, the Ukraine war or the Morocco earthquake. Apart from that, uh, we now head back to the impact of uh, AI or IKEA. I mean, we are like any other retail company, right? I mean, we have the same sort of systems, same sort of problems, and we also have AI in our strategy. So what that implies is that we have been investing to build a nice data and analytics organization, quite comprehensive, which is embedded with product teams, product teams that build digital products for the many people. However, the idea of these teams was that they're small, they're self-reliant, and develop with speed. But what has happened is that we've run into different issues where it is becoming more and more of a challenge to deploy a model from IDEA. I mean, as it is, we have a 20% IDEA to deployment rate, but with these challenges, uh, we started to drop even further. So what are these challenges, essentially? The infrastructure footprint, I mean, with the growing number of teams and growing number of uh, sort of AI use cases or AI ideas, we started to run into challenges with, with having the right compute available, right infrastructure available, right? When we were having our servers, we used to have one model per server. Big model, less compute. Small model, too much compute. And did we say governance yet? I mean, that's, that's another whole ball game. Now, coming to development. Uh, before, when we started out, it was my machine is my compute. I need a Python, a Jupyter notebook, and I'm good. But now with Gen AI and, and stuff that you already heard, it starts to become more and more complex with the compute that is required. We need to have a GPU. We need to have multi-tenancy so that multiple people can work together on the same compute. And that is challenging to do as it is today. And then, of course, uh, we've also had a huge transformation in how models are deployed, right? I mean, first of all, they're isolated from the software layer, and then they could be deployed in Canary, Blue, Green, and so on, which essentially means that we have challenges with scalability when the model gets suddenly a whole lot of data coming in, portability, which means the model needs to be present across different environments and on the edge, and so on and the isolation piece, because we need to be able to separate it from the software layer and yet maintain the same efficiency of like less than five milliseconds, for instance, for um, live models, which, which run on IK.com, for instance. Basically, all of this coming together, making it a sort of a complex situation with one big impact. A, ideas not moving, but more importantly, we take more and more sort of time to deploy models. And we have not even spoken about the data problems that come, right? That, that's for another talk. Now, moving ahead, right? I mean, uh, we heard the challenge. What was the solution, right? I mean, it was not all dark. That's where I say Docker entered the game and started to help us. I mean, there was a time when we were, for example, getting requests for development environments. And what we were essentially doing is allocating servers from the data center at times with people sharing them. or uh, people would use VMs in the cloud, which was pretty standard, and, and start to share them. But this had to change. And this started to change when we started to containerize and basically use Docker to give container as a data science environment for people to experiment. Let's take an example of a recommendation algorithm, right? I mean, we 
are now helping their teams with these different dockers in which they experiment the different recommendation algorithms that might be required, right? Call them the AI training lab. And, and after this vast experimentation, they end up with what's called as train models. These are the, with high accuracy, performing to the business case, and then these then come to us as model registries where we learn what's the metadata, the data versioning, the model versioning, and everything surrounding the model that needs to be deployed. Now we combine this model with Seldon Core, and then what we start to do is we deploy as requested. I mean, it can be a blue-green deployment, canary deployment, or even deployment in the edge. Right, so moving ahead. So this, this was the first step of our transformation, right? I mean, you heard, for example, how uh, Docker is uh, helping containerize development environments that allows us to you know, deliver better models at a faster pace. And then you heard how, for example, Docker, when combined with Seldon Core, is able to deliver a deployment platform which allows us to deploy at scale. Now, when we combine that with something like a Prometheus, we start to get the monitoring. Monitoring not just for the models, the model performance, but also the platform's performance, right? And it starts to become important because we need to have the model available 99.6% of the time, for instance. And when we combine that with, uh, for example, Seldon Alibi, we start to measure drifts and so on, adversaries, outliers, which is essential to you know, look at a future of automated retraining pipelines. And all of this comes together with, with IKEA's engineering. And, and we will deep dive into this whole platform in, in a talk at 1045 today. But that is essentially how the whole platform is built. And that brings us to one most important thing. What did we gain from doing all of these changes? I think the biggest gain has been that we are now 10 times faster from idea to production. I mean, we still have a 20% conversion rate in terms of uh, idea to production, but at least we are faster in doing that, right? I mean, we've gone from being 100 plus days to being less than 10 days to have a deployable model. And most importantly, we are also able to platform at scale. And the second thing, and then for us as a platform team, the biggest thing is how do you, your users actually look at your platform and, and what do they use it for? And we were uh, negative 10 for a long time, which means that our users were not really recommending our platform to other users or other data scientists. That has changed over the last two years. And now we're doing almost plus 18% and have more than 100 people actively using the platform today and deploying models, observing models, and so on. That's my time. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're sticking around uh, for the rest of the day as well. So happy to meet and connect with all of you. Have a nice day, and I give it back to Justin. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much. It's so great to hear our customers having success with Docker. It's what makes it so satisfying to work at Docker. It's why we come in every day to help you, and, and it just it makes us so happy to see you being successful. Behind these last two demos, uh, and the, the, the demos you saw earlier and, the, and the, the Karen's work, we saw a lot of Docker-trusted content being used to build secure, efficient applications. And um, Britain is going to come on and talk more about the work we're doing with secure and trusted content for AI ML applications, because this has been the, the real foundation of the success of many, many of your applications and, and the customers. So welcome, Brittany. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brittany, just as Justin said. I'm a product manager at Docker, and I'm so excited to get to talk to you all today. Uh, for the last 10 years, Docker has helped solve some critical developer pain points, such as reproducibility and portability. But today, I'm going to talk to you about another pain point, trust, and how some of the same solutions we've delivered to the community for years can be applied to machine learning. Development can be a complex and time-consuming process, you should be able to trust the tools you're using to automate tasks and streamline your development. Docker Trusted Content delivers dependable content from known sources to help developers build with secure foundations. While using unknown public images can pose security threats and jeopardize your machine learning models, with Docker Trusted Content, you can code confidently knowing you've started your application development off right. 
Let's dive a bit deeper into the categories of trusted content available on Docker Hub. How many of you have built an application using Docker trusted content? Uh, Justin, I know you have. <laughs> I can't see how many virtual hands are raised, but I'm betting it's a lot of you. Did you know the Nginx Docker official image has been pulled over 1 billion times to build countless applications? Docker Hub and trusted content have been a staple in the developer community for years. And now you can use these same trusted sources for AI and ML development. First, we have Docker official images. These are open source and maintained by Docker in collaboration with project maintainers. Docker thoroughly reviews the Docker files, ensuring they are secure and reliable. This means that official images are kept up to date with upstream security patches and bug fixes. They also support multiple architectures, providing even more value and accessibility to developers. Because DOI are built using a consistent process, are updated regularly, and are tested against a variety of criteria, they're often more performant and efficient than custom-built images. Next, we have Docker verified publisher images. These images come from trusted publishers who strive to meet industry standards and are subjected to security assessments. Additionally, DVPs are kept up to date. You can identify them by the blue check next to their image name. Last, but definitely not least, we have Docker-sponsored open source images, which come from open source projects that meet specific criteria, which includes confirming they're a verified source, that they have OSI-compliant licensing, and are updated regularly. Docker is deeply committed to supporting the open source community, so the projects in this program receive a range of free benefits, and we're adding a new benefit to that list. Starting in late 2023, all Docker-sponsored open source program members will receive a free team subscription to Docker Scout, which will play a critical role in building a more secure software supply chain. To sum it up, through rigorous review and support for our publishers, Docker Trusted Content offers the most reliable experience for developers, and by extension, the machine learning community. So let's talk about how this relates to you. Hundreds of AI and ML images are available on Docker Hub. Verified images from industry-leading AI and ML tools, including the Gen AI projects we just heard from, Neo4j, Langchain, and Alama, provide trusted content to ensure, to ensure a strong starting point for machine learning devs. In fact, just last month, the AI and ML content on Docker Hub received 34 million pools. Here are just a few examples of how you can build all your AI and ML stack with trusted content. For languages and databases, you can choose between R, Python, Neo4j, all official images. For models and frameworks, you can start off with Alama, Langchain, TensorFlow, PyTorch, or Intel Open Federated Learning, among many more. In MLOps, you can choose between Apache Spark, Jupyter Data Science Notebook, Redis ML, AWS SageMaker, MLflow, the list goes on, it's countless others. You can build your entire ML stack using trusted content, package it in a container, port it to other machines or external clusters, and share it with your teammates. They can easily reproduce your results with the click of a button. Recently, a developer shared his experience with me. He said, I was working on a project a while ago where the maintainer provided a container with everything set up for development. And it was literally one command to start iterating on the project. I cannot express how happy that made me. It was magical. Imagine you could have that with every data science project. That is an experience everyone at Docker believes the AI and ML community should have. With access to a trusted stack, along with the reproducibility and portability that Docker pooling provi tooling provides, it's easy to see why Docker and machine learning are a winning combination. If you want to learn more about how developers are utilizing trusted content to power their machine learning development, check out these blogs on the screen behind me. And thank you for your time. Thanks. Thanks so much, Brittany. Thanks. We talked about build and share. Um, now let's talk a little bit about run. Now, AI and ML you know, runs on a lot of the platforms we've, we're already familiar with. But actually, it's also opening up opportunities for new places. Data gravity is a real thing. Moving petabytes of data around to where your computers doesn't necessarily work. Um, sometimes you really want to move the Docker container to where the data is instead. And so we're seeing new platforms that are enabling this as well. So one platform, for example, in preview at the moment is Snowpark from Snowflake. 
um, and we're, we're, we're working with them uh, on bringing, bringing Docker to this and developer experience to this. And we see more of these platforms turning up, you know, which are combined data, container, AI, ML platforms. And we're, we're really excited to work, work with these new platforms, bring, bring the great developer experience of Docker to these new platforms. And we're, we're going to see a lot of change in the run side of things as well, and we'll be supporting that. Already, people are running their Docker ML applications in pretty weird and surprising places, actually. Uh, so let's talk to someone whose uh, applications are likely to get very wet and windy. It's a good thing Docker containers are actually quite waterproof. I mean, it's whales, after all, you know. So um, welcome, Lewis. Thank you, Justin. Thank all of you for being here today at DockerCon. So here we go. A couple of things before I dive deep in. I am with Western Ecosystems Technology. We are an environmental consulting company, and we focus mostly on the wind energy space and compliance for wind energy. Also, a very important note from the lawyers, nothing that I'm saying here today is in any way endorsed by or an opinion of the US Department of Energy. We are, of course, very grateful for their funding on this project. Also, this was a team effort, and these are the rest of the people on the team, so let's give it up for them. Thank you. So we've been hearing a lot about clouds at DocuCon lately. And when I say cloud, a lot of us think of this kind of cloud. It has some JavaScript, it has some CPUs, it maybe has some databases, it may be a very specific shade of light blue, possibly even Azure. And most importantly, it has internet connectivity. But at rest and in the environmental consulting space in general, this is our cloud, and it has real clouds and some very nice sunsets that are much better than all of your sunsets. <laughs> so to take our machine learning models out into this real world and make them interact with data, there are some challenges. And we did a pilot study to evaluate how to overcome those challenges. And it turned out Docker was pretty useful to us. The basic idea of our pilot study in 10 seconds is we wanted to use computer vision to analyze the video of the moment that a moving turbine blade interacts with a flying animal. And we wanted to do this in an offshore environment. Now, I don't know how many of you have checked the cell surface maps for the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. But spoiler alert, there is very little cell surface in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And that brings up some new challenges that we collect all this data, and it can be in the hundreds of gigabytes per day. And without strong connectivity to a nice computing cloud, we, that data sort of has nowhere to go, and it piles up, which means we need to analyze it at the same place and at the same time we collect it, which is sort of the essence of Edge ML. That, incidentally, also means we have a pretty high computational load. Now, Edge ML, I don't know how many of you have done it, but it's kind of tricky, a lot of pieces that have to work together. Edge ML, when you cannot connect to any of your Edge devices, is even more tricky. I would say about an order of magnitude more tricky. Also, it's sort of paradoxical, but it turns out that the best solution for these highly connected computing clouds, i.e. Docker, is also a really good solution when you're doing this disconnected edge ML. The reason for this is that the central problem in both cases is the same. The central problem in both cases is the consistency between different software environments. Now, we can, if, without containerization or something similar, we can sit around and build some beautiful functional applications on our dev machines and send them off to the prod machine. And because the t if the two environments are different, 
the, they may not be beautiful functional applications anymore. I mean, all my applications are always beautiful at all times, but they may not be functional. And that's a problem, especially when you have no connectivity. You might send it out for three months, and you do not want to come back in three months and find out that it never even started up because you were missing the version of the library that you didn't even think about. You would be very sad if that happened. So, sort of circling back, we did a pilot study to validate how to deal with these challenges. We took a camera and we installed it on a land-based wind turbine, land-based for access, just because it was a pilot. We had many video streams to process all in real time, six to be exact. In the middle of our deployment, we had to do a redeployment. And we had very little supervision. And because we put all of our, basically all of our pipeline and all of our ML in Docker containers, that really, that really proved that the containerization and standardization smoothed the road for us in many, many instances. And I can truly say that it worked, and not just on my machine. So if you want to hear about more of those instances, while you're watching this beautiful video of a YOLO model drawing boxes around flying birds, I would like to remind you I'll be talking at length about this project at 2.30 PM today. Thank all of you, and thank Darko for having me. Thanks so much. Yeah. So that, that was pretty cool. Um, we, again, we, we, we love to see what people are doing with Docker. It always surprises us. And uh, you're doing so many different and varied things. It's really great. You know, so you, you've seen all these. You've seen these demos, um, you've seen what other people are doing, and you have ideas. How do you bring these to your organization? How do you go from prototype to shipping something? Um, let's talk about that with Debbie Madden. Morning. Hello. Can we sit? Yes, let's sit. All right, let's use the chairs. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, so we're going to zoom out. And we talked about build, share, run. Now we're going to talk about the learning journey. Yeah. And I'm really wanna, looking forward to this. You want to introduce yourself first, though. Absolutely. Not everyone here knows you. Yes. Um, so my name is Debbie Madden. I am uh, several things. I wear many hats. I am the founder and chair of Stride. So what does Stride do? We make good teams great. And we do that in two ways, by helping you deliver custom software to your customers and by upskilling your teams. Um, I've been an entrepreneur for almost 30 years. Um, don't tell anyone. Um, I am also the host of the podcast, Scaling Tech. I am the author of the book, Hire Women. And I am also a Docker advisor. And uh, so that's uh, some of the things I do. Um, and in, in my day job, you can really think of me as a pattern finder, right? As the founder of a tech consultancy, it's my job. As you can imagine, over 30 years, lots of shiny objects come my way, right? And it's my job to decide like, which to hold on to, which to examine, and which ones to let and, go. And, and how did how did you decide that Gen I was one of the keepers and the important <laughs> ones? <laughs> so the, uh, I've been I've been asking myself um, where where does Stride fit in the Gen AI landscape, and I'm still asking myself that question. But I really haven't seen a unified movement since Agile, right? And I've been I was writing software and running tech companies since before Agile. <laughs> um, but when Agile came along about 20 years ago, that was a shiny object that I held on tight to. That was really a unified bottom-up movement. But with Gen AI, and I think a lot of this today know this and see this on our teams and, and in our companies and in our day-to-day, -day, this is a movement that is not only unified, but it is both bottom up in a how fast can we go and how many cool things that we can do with Docker, with our use cases, but it's also very um, top down in a weird kind of FOMO way, <laughs> right? Like the executives, the stakeholders, we want to go. We don't know why or where or how yet, but we know we want to be there, right? And so that, those are some of the reasons why I'm excited about this journey. But it's difficult to go on a journey when you don't know where it's going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not only do we not know where it's going, but, but the rules of the game are changing so fast. Not only is the adoption curve 
rapid, as we know. Um, but the goalposts are changing every single day. And so one thing that I want to just make very clear is when we are, we're, take, we're taking a bet at Stride, at Generative AI, um, for sure. We've decided we're taking a bet. But it's not a, it's not a switch. We don't wake up and say, OK, we're, we're, we're doing this now, <laughs> right? Um, Justin and I were talking a couple weeks ago. It's kind of like when you learn a software uh, tool, a technology, a process, and then you learn a new one, right? Um, for me, I'm not a software engineer, but it's like how I felt when I went snowboarding for the first time, right? I knew how to ski. Hey, Scott. <laughs> 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 and I never had been snowboarding before, right? Put on the snowboard, I got this, it's easy. Wasn't so easy. I fell, I got hurt. And so the thing with, we decide to experiment with Gen AI, go on this learning journey. But here's the thing, as you're experimenting with this in your jobs, right? Because we get to come to DockerCon, but then we have to go back and write code yep. and hit our OKRs, right? It has to be a journey. We have to be okay with falling down the mountain. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so how, 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 do you, how do you think about structuring this journey for an organization as they, you know, from, from the experimenting and falling down stage onwards? So the, yeah, the, the crawl, walk, run approach, as we like to refer it. And this is really true whether you just are experimenting with, with generative AI and LLM tools, or if you're an expert, right? I talk to many developers, CTOs, across industry, across company size, across location. And what I've done, and if, if you can walk away with this, uh, of this talk with like one or two kind of things, I'm gonna take this back to my job, to my day, then um, I will have done my job here today. But there really is, when we're talking about a safe experimentation, there's three stages, right? The first is the, the crawl stage, the, okay, I'm gonna do this on my spare time, I'm gonna be a sponge, I'm gonna come to events like DockerCon and I'm just gonna learn, and, and the really important thing at this stage is fail fast and experiment, right? And, and learn and play and, and ex ex discover the variety of what's going on. I mean, it's such a huge space. The, the, with, with that point, um, the, you have to know the rules of the game yeah. you're playing, and in this particular case, the rules of the game are changing every day, yeah. right? So it's not, it's confusing. Wait, yeah. are we playing chess? Are we playing Monopoly? Well, tomorrow we're playing a game that no one's invented yet, yeah. right? So you have to know the rules, and then you have to be okay to fail, to fall down, to experiment, right? That's the easy part, right? It may seem hard, but that's not the hard part. The hard part is committing, is the expansion part. When you say, I'm going beyond um, prompting chat GPT. I might want a secure instance. I might want to train a tool with my company's private data. Then what happens, right? Then you have to get a commitment. You have to get time. You might have to set OKRs against this thing. And that's where, that's where I'm seeing not so much developers, but the stakeholders get stuck, right? Because remember, they're like, I don't know where I'm going, but I want, I want it. Get it to me. I want to do it, right? And then once you show them, this is what this tool, this technology, this process, generative AI can bring to you. By the way, HR teams, legal teams, finance teams are lining up saying, can we use this to write our contracts to onboard employees? Now, all of a sudden, uh, the stakeholders get stuck, right? And what I've seen is a most powerful way to unstuck them that everyone in this room and online can help with is, we don't know all the answers. We don't know what tooling we're going to use, what powerful use case it is, but how can we as technologists help our stakeholders find that compelling use case that despite how scary it is, they, they, they must move forward, they're compelled to move forward, right? And then the last piece, once you've done that, that's yeah. the hardest part, the hardest part is convincing your stakeholder to take a chance on something meaningful that's going to take time is as a software engineer, as a developer, what is your informed opinion on what good looks like for the use case that you've just gone and convinced your CEO to let you do, right? What, what does good look like, yeah. right? And so like, that's for me the way to kind of process, and we, this is how I've been processing the shiny objects that I've held <laughs> on to for 20, 30 years. And the difference now is, um, uh, you wake up in the morning and there's new shiny objects. You wake up in the morning and there's and, new and, and your idea of what good is might change with the, the shininess. Yes. And, and the, the idea of what, not knowing how, how good you can make it, where it could go is, you know, so you have to be constantly iterating and rethinking Absolutely. those choices. As Absolutely. I was at, I was at EdTech uh, week in New York City on Monday 
and uh, someone from Google said, if you're using out of the box chat GPT, you're not only behind, but you're behind the students. <laughs> and, uh, oh, right. Those types of comments are being spoken now in October, right? And so it, 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 that what does good look like and what is your informed opinion? This is that like two opposing things um, are often true at the same time, despite the rapid advances. It's our job in this room and, and the folks watching remotely to, to have that focus. And that's how we move forward. That's how we make progress. That's how we bring generative AI and LLMs to use cases that we, we don't even, we aren't even thinking of yet, but we will as a group, right? And so really exciting stuff. And, um, and if you could just kind of bring this framework. And the, the last thing I really want to say is we have a couple minutes, right? Yeah. This, is, this is not the end. We all know this, right? Please don't go this alone. Um, you're here, so that means you value learning, right? And I, w I really, truly want to help you on this journey. Um, and I mean this, and this is, a true, this is a true reach out, an olive branch to help. If you have questions, I want to be there for you. Um, find me on LinkedIn, um, and, and I will, I will answer your questions, right? And I'll connect you with people that, that have the answers to your questions. I probably don't have them all. Right, but let's use each other like we're doing today. And thank yeah. you, Justin, for bringing us well, all together. It's, it's amazing. It, I always learn things when I'm with you, and it's always Damn. very a great. It's always great to share and learn with you, and it's always a great, ex a great experience for me. And uh, that's why I always love to be, love to love to be with you in person again. Absolutely, yes. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day, and thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Bye. Th thanks so much, Debbie. At Docker, we've been taking these lessons to heart ourselves. We've been going through this learning experience about AI and what it means for us, um, and exploring the, the potential. And you know, we, we, we've we've had to iterate and experiment and think about what it means. So, um, you know, after ten years at Docker, we spent you know time every day with our community. Docker's grown from a tool that was just an early adopter tool to a tool that millions and millions of people use every day. And we've learned a huge amount during that time about what you find difficult, what you find easy with Docker, what you, um, what, you know, what's difficult when you, on day one, when you turn up at your company and they say, oh, we're using this Docker thing today. And you're like, what's Docker? Um, uh, I remember having a friend coming to me and said, my company started using Docker today. And I, and I remembered that you were there. And I said, I don't know what it does. And um, you know, it's like this is, every day, there are thousands and thousands of people going through this experience. Um, and it, it, when people are more experienced, they still have problems working with Docker. They have things that they, that they can't remember how to do, things that they can learn to do better. So we wondered if we could share all this breadth of knowledge that we have about Docker with you. And we decided it by building a tool uh, that would help you learn to use Docker more effectively and that we can grow with. So um, welcome you and to show us what, what we've been building and uh, bring this to you. Thanks, Ewan. Thank you, Justin. Um, as Justin said, my name is Ewan. I'm a machine learning engineer at Docker. I'm on the team working on this new Docker AI assistant. Um, and just to give a brief overview, the uh, assistant is actually right now a VS Code extension. It will open an interactive notebook, and that serves as the interface for the assistant. And it's a holistic integration between the developer's project uh, environment that serves as context for these new generative AI technologies, as well as a knowledge graph we're building off of Docker expertise. So I'll actually be doing two demos. This is the first one. Um, say I'm a developer. I'm working in this Node project. I'm using NPM. And I've finished the application. You know, I'm testing it locally. Um, everything looks good. And now I have a requirement that I need to Dockerize this project. I need to put it in a container. And maybe I've done this before. I've written a Docker file, but I'm not 100% confident. I might have to go back, review previous projects, look up documentation. But I do know my company now has this new Docker AI assistant. Um, I've been onboarded to it, and I know it's available from the VS Code command palette as this ask assistant uh, option. 
So I click on it, a bunch of uh, pre-populated questions come up, and I see this, how do I dockerize my project? Well, this is exactly what I want to do, right? I need to containerize this application, and it pulls up this notebook. Um, and in case you're not familiar with notebooks, um, this is based off of the Jupyter notebooks that are very popular in the data science ML space. It provides interactive cells, you can visualize data, um, and you can even document your process. So let's go through this. This is the recommendation, Docker init. Um, and the notebook pulls up, this is actually an interactive terminal. It sees that I'm in a Node project, use the default version of Node. Again, detected, I'm using NPM, right? All the defaults are correct here. And then just put my server in, and that's it. You can see now, in my project context, I have all the necessary Docker files. Um, I didn't have to go through and, and write them myself, um, didn't have to remember all of the syntax. And again, from the notebook, I have the recommendation for my next step, which is Docker Compose Up. You can see, again, this is um, pulling up a terminal, so I can see all of the uh, logs from the build. And then now my container has started, and the assistant is loading recommendation for me. So here, you can see that it's pulled up some information, has the latest container, um, it has the ports it's running on, as well as the image. Um, and I can confirm this, right? I don't have to look up the actual uh, container name. I can just pull up the logs right away. It's listing on port 3000. Um, and so I've, I've confirmed my application is working as expected in the Docker container. And again, the, the assistant has uh, recommended as a reminder, you know, when I'm done, Docker compose down and kind of close everything, clean up my environment. And so this, this notebook and the, all of these commands have saved me valuable time because I don't have to go through and write these files by hand. Um, and basically, I'm done dockerizing. I can push this now or continue on developing. So that's the first workflow. This is the second one um, where I've actually inherited a project, and it already has some Docker components. Um, but maybe I'm, I'm brand new to the project, not, again, super familiar with Docker, but I do have this assistant now. Um, and since I'm, I'm starting the project, I say, OK, tell me, tell me what this project is about. Right? Summarize it for me, and let's see what the recommendation I get. OK, so it's telling me this is a Node application. It's containerized using Docker, gives me some information about the Docker file, and tells me it's packaged with Docker for easy and consistent deployment. And then I get this nice little recommendation. If I want to get started with Docker, I can just build. It gives me a tag name. And I see here there's an error. Um, and I don't know how often this happens to you. You're given a project, you're told it's working, and there's this error now. And you're like, do I bug the person who gave it to me and tell them maybe they made a mistake? Do I spend time Googling it and trying to figure it out? Well, now you don't have to do either of those things. Um, the assistant has actually identified that the error is in my Docker file, and it pulls up the Docker file in the notebook. So this is actually a view onto the actual file. If I make changes in the cell, those will be reflected in the Docker file and vice versa. So I don't have to open the separate tab. It's all in my notebook. And here, the uh, Docker AI assistant has actually highlighted the problem. It says, your uh, ver the version of this Node.js image you're trying to install is not supported anymore. So I can go to the quick fix. You can see it actually pulls up several options. We recommend the Docker AI option to update the package. Um, you can see now no more error. Um, and I want to emphasize that this is not just pulling up the latest image. We've actually integrated with Docker Scout, which everyone has been hearing about. So it's not only the latest, but it's also the most secure image. Um, and so you don't have to do all of that work to double check your image. You have the Docker Scout right in the notebook, right in your project. So I can go back to the cell, rebuild, and great. I don't have the error anymore, and I didn't have to spend all of that time talking to uh, you know, slacking people or, or Googling. 
So now I get the next recommendation, and it's telling me my project is missing a Docker ignore file. Um, and maybe this is something I hadn't thought about or I wasn't fully aware of why that's important. And so, again, I don't have to write it myself. I can just run this command, touch Docker ignore, and it says, your file has been created. Please remember to check and save the contents. You can see, again, um, it's kind of pre-populated with uh, common files that might uh, clog up my build context. And I can build again to get the smaller image. Um, now, of course, this is a, a demo project, so it's not, it doesn't have a lot of big files. My image is only 249 megabytes. But you can imagine if I were working in a really big project, this could save me um, a lot of space. And so finally, Docker run. Um, and as this is running, you can see, again, it's generated this container. And I get information about the flags from example, dash D in detached mode, dash P publishing to default ports. Um, and especially if I'm new to Docker, this is all information I would have to Google or learn from uh, a more senior dev. Um, but I have all, kind of all of this learning right in, in my notebook. Um, OK, and uh, finally, it tells me, similar to the last flow, now you have your container. You can verify your application. You can see here everything is working as expected, a nice little hello. Um, and so the Docker AI assistant has saved me as the developer of valuable time. Right? I could get started with a project. I debugged the project, modified my Docker file, ran these commands with best practices all in a single notebook. Um, and so our goal with Docker AI is to help you save time, uh, uh, mitigate some of the challenges of Docker, and give you back time to build your application. So thank you very much. <laughs> That was pretty great, wasn't it? Yeah. I, <laughs> if you're excited about Docker AI, uh, sign up here for the Early Access Program. We're going to start rolling out access to people to um, get it going. But it'll be, um, uh, you know, sign up, sign up, sign up now, and we'll we'll be really excited to onboard people, get detailed feedback, and uh, before it goes GA, um, really, really exciting. It's been a it's been great fun working on it and, and seeing it come together. And as you see, it's like really, really nice and friendly to use and, and nicely embedded in your development environment. Well, one more thing. You know, our laptops have been getting more and more powerful. I and mean, we have a lot of people who are using you know, the new Apple laptops. They're great. Uh, you know. um, but these machines have. You know, they have GPUs often, and they have hardware acceleration and things like that. But it's actually very difficult for developers to use these for you know, building AI ML applications locally in containers. And we've been getting a lot of feedback from you that the whole, the whole world of you know, GPUs and hardware acceleration is just really hard, and can we help make it easier? Um, so one of the things we've been thinking about is like how to how to make it easier in the developer context on your laptop. How can we use your GPU, not just you know your CPUs for running Docker containers, but your GPUs as well? Now, a while back, um, the the web browser community started building a new technology for shipping GPU support in the browser called Web GPU, um, and it's now actually shipping GA in Chrome, and it's going to ship in Firefox soon. Um, well, actually, it's kind of an interesting standard. It's a really, um, you know, it's a it's a modern graphic standard on the kind of design of things like Metal. It's designed for not just for rendering, but also for doing GPU compute. Um, and it also runs not only in the browser. It's actually um, you can run it in lots of different places. Um, and it's it's very early stage, but there's an ecosystem is starting to build around this for AI ML apps as well. There's some early adopter projects. We've been working with the Burn Rust AI project, which is a great, cool project, um, and they've got they've got some support. And uh, Cloudflare announced support for is coming soon for workers. So there's a there's a community starting to build around this. Now this is. Really early stage work. This is very much a sneak preview. Um, you know, it's, we're not going to show any really exciting demo, but it's, you know, 
we're all geeks. We like uh, little demos that show what's coming in the future. We're really working, you know, in the open and showing, sharing early and often with you. So there's lots more to do here, but I'd love to welcome um, Piotr on to show us where we are now with this. Hey, everyone. Thanks, Justin. Hey, uh, I'm Piotr. I'm a developer working on the back end of Docker Desktop day to day, but I wanted to talk about something that falls ever so slightly outside that box today. So let's consider um, I wanted to run an ML or a similarly characterized um, workload in a container on my laptop. Mm. So I'll, I'll start my um, workload here. Um, so in this demo, that role is played by a very sim simple program doing matrix multiplication. It's basically 4 meg worth of 2s multiplied by 4 meg worth of 3s. And it gives you here uh, the result. And I timed the uh, computation. So on the CPU graph there, you can see that, yeah, my CPU is pretty much pinned which may be good because, you know, I'm, I'm using the compute as efficiently as possible, but it's, the, the time is not great. You know, we are pushing almost a second to do that uh, two matrix multiply. Um, so yeah, I could improve my implementation for the CPU because it's a naive multi, uh, matrix multiply implementation. But you know, the, uh, we know the elephant in the room. Like we have devices that are designed to actually carry out those computations. So we thought it would be really awesome if we could give access to those uh, to you from within Docker Desktop. And uh, unfortunately, it's not such a simple uh, problem to solve. But this is where WebGPU comes to the rescue. Um, so let's. Um, consider my second example. So yeah, I rebuilt my program. And now we can see it's running way faster by the output itself. Um, the timings you can see are an order of magnitude better. And on the graph there, on, on the CPU, you can see that we are pretty nicely saturating uh, the compute there. Um, so now let's switch to the slides. Um, I'll take you a bit through what actually happened. Cool. Um, so you can see uh, in the command line, we have that uh, dash dash device um, specifier. Uh, this takes us uh, to CDI, which is Container Device Interface, which basically tells uh, the Docker engine to amend uh, the running container uh, with uh, several pieces of um, environment, which in our case is a WebGPU client library, the headers that give you the WebGPU API, and the comms endpoint for uh, desktop to talk to the WebGPU runtime. Could I have the next slide, please? Cool. So this is uh, a picture of what's going on in the back, uh, in the back end. So you notice that I rebuilt my example there uh, when I started the container with WebGPU support. What that did is basically it um, linked my workload against uh, the WebGPU client library. Um, I could also dynamically load it. And that WebGPU client library knows about the vSocket that's integrated in Docker Desktop, behind which we have a WebGPU runtime server running on my laptop, basically giving me uh, access to GPU compute on my laptop. So yeah. thanks for your attention, and hope you're ex as excited about the possibilities this gives us in the future. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Piotr. That, that was really great. I mean, as you can see, you know, it's um, early work. It's coming soon. Um, there's more work to do to bring real applications to it, but we're really, really excited about this. And um, 
you know, we just wanted to share it with you early because it was, uh, you know, it's, it's showing, showing paths to using GPU on developer machines, and it's really about bringing the kind of, you know, portability and openness of Docker to many more places. If you're interested in this, come to the Docker Lab space here to learn more, talk to Piotr. We're going to be um, talking more about this, doing more work on it, but um, it's, you know, it's, it's coming soon, very exciting. Um, you know, lots more things you can do, do with, with Docker, so really, really cool. The simplicity and power that Docker brought with build, share, and run is really still what we need with AI and ML applications. I think this is, you know, you can see from, the, from what we've had today. If anything, the additional complexity and pace of change in these stacks makes it even more vital. We've, we've been showing you stuff that's early in, in development and while we're doing it, because like, this is the way that the AI ML space is. Things are happening really fast. We, we can't like, build things sort of out slowly and ship them later. We've got to iterate fast, work with you, ship stuff to you early and often, and um, really experiment in new things and get feedback from you on what you think would be cool for us to build, what kind of things there are. You know, we spend a lot of time talking to, talking to people who are working in this space, the people we've seen on stage here, from all sorts of different spaces who are just excited by what we can bring. And we're really committed to investing in this area to bring the magical Docker experience to whatever you're working on in the future and all the kinds of things that happen in this explosion of innovation and, and new, new tech. So it's, it's a really exciting time. We're really here to be a partner for you and to bring that developer experience, the ease of use, the learning, the build, chair, run experience to all sorts, of, all sorts of new and exciting applications that you're building. So it's a really, really exciting time. Um, finally, I'm going to sit down and talk with another tool builder. Um, Eric from Git Kraken is, a, is also building developer tools, and we're going to talk about developer tools in the age of AI. So welcome, Eric. I like your t-shirt. Like t-shirt. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Eric Amodio. I'm the CTO of Git Kraken and creator of GitLens. We, we, Docker and Git Kraken share a lot of you know, DNA in what we do. We think about problems in the same way. We have the same goal of like, maximizing the time developers spend on their work and minimizing the time they spend just wasted on, on the bits that don't count. So I think that's, right. you know, that's why we, we get on well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. I mean, you know, we're... You know, just we love developers. We are developers, uh, and yeah, we're just trying to empower them to you know be most effective and really spend the time innovating and in creating rather than you know all the extra tasks that we all have to do. Um, and that's why I'm just like you know so excited about how what AI is going to bring to that. Yeah, I mean, what, what's it going to change? What's what, what's going to be different about AI? How, how, you know, yeah, you've you've had a lot of ex <laughs> experience already in this area. Yeah, I mean, it's been re really interesting just seeing the journey on you know things that came out of that and, you know, how we started with AI, you know, when I originally, you know, would think about what AI would bring to the, de you know, developer experience and that sort of thing. And, and you know, we, we didn't think it would write code for us. <laughs> so that, that, that's definitely been, an, it, you know, an interesting change. Um, but, I mean, I think, it, you know, it really just changes, like, the complexities that we can deal with, the, the context that it can provide and help accelerate us, and to, you know, to use it effectively as a tool. Um, and, it, you know, it's still really early days. Um, you know, back when I was at Microsoft working on the VS Code team, uh, it was when GitHub was just incubating the Copilot project. So I was working really closely with the Copilot team of how to get that into VS Code. And, you know, the first versions of Copilot were just, you know, comically bad. <laughs> like, it was just so <laughs> unusable, and it was like questioning whether or not the, like, this could actually be something really powerful. Um, but in really, in a few short weeks to a month or so, it really just started radically changing, and it just kind of continued get, to get better. And, and, and it's really, do we've just been on that same extreme uh, exponential growth since it started. I mean, exponential growth and like the uncertainty is just, it, it can be scary. Like, what? what What's going to happen to develop? You know, pe people people wa wonder what's going to happen to their jobs and and how they work. I mean, how do you, how do you see that playing out? 
Yeah, I mean, I, you, know, I, you know, I think you know, we are moving to the future where you know, machines, the AIs, are going to write a lot more of the code. Um, but I don't see that as you know, an existential crisis for developers because you know, really our, our job is not to write code. <laughs> I mean, when it comes down to it, our job is to you know, synthesize problems, create solutions, you know, innovate, do other things to really you know, solve whatever we're trying to tackle. Solve, solve business problems, customer problems. Oh, you know, yes. Make the world, Invent, make the world, make the world a better place. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so I mean, just like focus on that is like, you know, we're, we're really poised for that. And you know, one other thing too is LMs right now, I mean, this you know, obviously will change over time, but they're really not great at handing the, handling the gray area. Um, the the, the in-betweens, the, you know, sort of trying to understand the problem space, the nuance around that, you know, moving requirements, that sort of thing. But they're really good at doing individual tasks. So using them and leveraging them as tools to really accelerate what we do, I think will bring, you know, much more power to uh, what we can accomplish. So we can accelerate the, the iteration process, the trial and error process, the prototyping process, all these, all, all these parts of the journey as well. So we can actually end up building better tools in the end because we have, we, we have more ability to try, try different things out for us rather than going down one particular route. Exactly, yeah. I mean, you can just, you know, instead of trying to think of like, oh, how do we get to the little step, we can, you know, plow right through those steps and get to where we really want to with that ultimate solution and that vision there. Um, and, you know, it, it's, you know it, it's really, really interesting of how fast that's evolving. I mean, the, the, the fast thing is, you know, it's, it's been really surprising. I mean, what, how, how do you see that playing out? Like, well, what does it, what, what's next on the exponential curve? <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> predicting the future is always hard, especially <laughs> with, uh, you know, exponential curves. We're not good at, uh, at seeing that. But, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I think that we, we really need to start transitioning to from, you know, like a lot of this stuff, you know, AI tools are really focused on, you know, a, an individual or like, you know, Increasing the productivity, and you know, as we start moving into teams, um, you know, as our world, you know, it, you know, over time, we've been transitioning to a lot more of where development is a, is a team sport. You know, code bases are more complex. The, the things we're tr the problems we're trying to solve are more complex than ever. And you know, trying to you know help manage that complexity at the individual level is what you know we've been seeing a lot of. But like, you know, how do we get teams to function better together? You know. To get a higher functioning team is not just to empower you know, individuals to work more effectively, it's to work more cohesively together to really affect the connections between them, be more proactive, share context. You know, this, I think there's going to be a lot of innovation through that, and that's you know, something I want to see a lot more from tool, tool builders. You know, we're spending a lot of time at Kraken you know, thinking about that problem, how we can sort of get teams share context better. You know, if you're, you know, Communicate better is ultimately the, the, the biggest challenge um, to get over that hump. And the, you know, I think AI is going to play a big role in sort of being able to handle and see a lot of the context you know, through Slack conversations, through PRs, through issues, through all these different things, and be able to surface up, you know, hey, maybe you know, did you know that this thing was happening and you, we'd notice that you didn't have that context and sort of being much more active and proactive about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, 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 we've, we've been thinking about much of the same sort of things about team collaboration. I mean, Doc, there's always been an important team role in Docker and the, the share in build, share, run was, you know, one of the kind of early kind of team focused experiences. But I think that, you know, the, the role of the, you know, the role of the team, the, as you say, the context in the team is really important. That's, again, that's part of where Docker Scout came from for us, was thinking about how do we bring a data model to the team to store the kind, you know, to store and the kind of data we want to give to the team to help, help bring a, you know, a richer data plane to the team to get context in and out of the team. And so that was part of the way that thinking came from as well. But I think that, um, you know, so, so yeah, team collaboration is really, really key to the future of development. But, you know, AI is, a, is more members of your team. I mean, it's not just a personal thing. It's like you can think of it as being new team members with new right. capabilities and new, maybe, things that they can't do as well. But, or, or the, and, you know, as we saw from a lot of the demos earlier today, like bringing the right context to the AI enables it to actually work incredibly much more effectively. And then that's, you know, I think that's a lot of what we've learned about models is that the context is what 
is you know it's, it's kind of it's limiting factor in size sometimes, but it's like it's it's where where you're bringing the value into the into the AI solution. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, like. Humans are not really different. If you know, if you bring <laughs> humans really good uh, context, you know, we can do really incredible things. Uh, so you know, but you know, context is something that is still challenging. Through through that is just getting the LMs to have enough context and you know, being able to really understand some of that that space. Um, but yeah, like go get them in the flow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it, yeah, and just you know, thinking of them as you know, leveraging the you know, to be a part of that team to really enhance that context that everyone shares, right? To, you know, you know, if we're on a team and we're working and, you know, like if I can change what, what, what I'm thinking about, uh, you know, this PR, I'm not going to get, get to it, you know, review times, like all of that sort of stuff. If we can optimize how the, you know, the LLMs can, you know, influence of just quantify things, set context, share that better, um, you know, we can move far more effectively than we have in the past. There's, there's been a, Industry movement to kind of shift left to bring things to the developer to the inner loop. How do you feel that kind of fits with the team collaboration aspect? And, and you know, how do you see the future of shift left? And yeah, I mean, I think you know, just moving from you know, the earlier we do things, the earlier we collaborate, you know, and that sort of thing. And you know, that's one of the things to even just from that individual side, getting you know, in in the space of having that co-pilot, you know, it's such a perfect name uh, with you as you're evolving, uh, really just is going to accelerate that time. So if we can sort of share that context, get things shared way earlier. Uh, you know, we're working on tools to make it easier for developers to share things, to collaborate on them, get feedback, even have LMs in the process to get feedback and tighten up that loop. Um, you know, the, the, the quicker we'll be able to, to do that. Um, but We've been talking a bunch about um, opinionated versus non-opinionated tools. And um, we were talking the other day about you know, the, the pull request, which you know, it was one of the big innovations of GitHub, but it was, it, it sort of sometimes, somehow people think it's unopinionated, but it actually creates a very opinionated workflow. And we're kind of seeing more kind of pushback experimentation in, in workflows in, in Git, for example, and uh, other things. And, you know, I think you, you've got, you've got strong opinions about opinionation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, I think that's, you know, being opinionated and being, you know, tra the transition from active, uh, sort of from passive to active is something that our tools need to do a lot more. Uh, is, you know, we really, you know, we've seen a lot of, you know, things are out there, you know, different great best, best practices, how we can sort of evolve beyond um, just providing a set of tools that, you know, all the individual teams have to figure out how to piece together to be, like use them most effectively. Um, so yeah, I mean the PR really doesn't feel so opinionated, but it's extremely opinionated for how to get code into you know into your project, uh, accept it, review it, all that sort of stuff, and it really changed the workflows of teams of how they work together across that. And you know, there's pluses and minuses to that as well. There's been challenges, but just yeah, like. Being able to be really opinionated, I think one of the benefits too with that LMs will provide is being able to see a lot more and actually manage and adjust and tune some of those opinionated workflows or, or things that suggestions or actions and nudges that would be provided through the tools um, to adapt in real time to see the context of your team, but also provide tuning parameters to say, you know, like my team values shipping very quickly, my team values code quality, so like you know we have to have no bugs, uh, and like being able to you know slide those slider bars, what is effective for your team, and then adapt most appropriately. So it's not like a one size fits all opinion, but really adaptive in flow, but still you know. Lead, lead the teams where you, you want them to go to be, you know, work more effectively together. I mean, common, common approaches across the industry rather than just kind of special, special, special design for every company has a, has a huge sort of ecosystem advantage in, for tooling, for workflows, for uh, onboarding developers easily. And like if it, but if you can have these workflows not be restrictive and not be annoying, but flexible, but make sure that there is a, it's a flow in a workflow is really important, I think. Exactly, yeah. And in, in, in just, you know, being able to 
you know, nudge and be more active in that flow is just, you know, suggest to changes. You know, like, you know, it, there's, there's a review that's been sitting, hey, the, you know, the tool nudges you and says, hey, you know, hey, this thing has been sitting, your teammates are waiting on you. Um, or, you know, hey, your teammate's out or your teammate snooze something and says, well, I can't get to it. So that you can, you should assign a new reviewer to get someone to do that or quantify that, you know, this PR is probably only going to take a few minutes to review. This one may take a long time. Maybe we even suggest at the beginning that, you know, hey, the, the person submitting the PR should be breaking that down to make it easier to review on their teammates. Um, so I think there's just a lot in that, you know, to help that flow and yeah, yeah. better teammates. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, we've been thinking about that a lot with Docker, again, with Docker Scouts about like how to, you know, how to set overall targets for where we want the company, you know, where you want the organization to be and then how to deliver that effectively through the flows that developers right. have to do without like, you know, you don't want to alert when you're doing something else, <laughs> right, or, you exactly. know, those kinds of workflows are just terrible. But it's got to be want, very context aware. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be context aware. It's got to understand like, like, and work out like which of these tasks are easy or quick and which ones are difficult, which is something like, again, with pull request review, like yep. so someone gives you five things to review and three of them take three minutes and then one of them is takes half a day and it's like you need to know that in advance yeah. so you can plan. Don't pick the wrong one and yeah. the rest are all gated behind it. Yeah, exactly. Um. So to, to kind of wrap up, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think one of the things is just, you know, like I was, you know, mentioned a lot of the things we've seen here today is just like, you know, we really need to embrace LLMs and, and sort of the AI going forward. You know, it's a, it's a very effective tool and, you know, we're very effective tool users. Uh, so, you know, take advantage of it. Don't be afraid of it. Uh, you know, really just lean into how you know, we can leverage these tools more effectively and, and shift. I mean, one of the challenges too is just getting from thinking your job is to write code to really solving problems. And the more we move into the solving problems part, the more secure your future and, and everything we do will be. Cool. Uh, thank so you so much for having me. And yeah, we're, we're, we're back at super excited to have Justin joining us at GitCon in a few weeks and for his Git uh, looking forward to keynote. It. So thanks so much. Thanks for so much. Me. Thank you. Thanks. Well, enjoy day two of DockerCon. So much to learn, so much to discover, so much to play with, so many new toys, shiny things. Um, really looking forward to seeing you all around. Um, and so have a, have a really, really great day. <laughs>